Welcome back to HPE Discover 2021, the Cube's virtual coverage, continuous coverage of HP's, HPE's annual customer event. My name is Dave Vellante, and we're, we're going to dive into the intersection of high performance computing, data, and AI with Dr. Eng Lim Go, who is the Senior Vice President and CTO for AI at Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Dr. Go, great to see you again. Welcome back to the Cube. Hey, hello, Dave. Great to talk to you again. You might remember last year, we talked a lot about swarm intelligence and how AI is evolving. Of course, you hosted the day two keynotes here at Discover. You talked about thriving in the age of insights and how to craft a data centric strategy. And you, you addressed you know, some of the biggest problems that I think organizations face with data. And that's, you got to, data is plentiful, but insights, they're harder to come by. And you really yeah. dug into some great examples in retail banking and medicine and healthcare and media. But stepping back a little bit, we'll zoom out on, on Discover 21, you know, what do you make of the event so far and some of your big takeaways? Hmm. Well, you started with a, the insightful question, right? Yeah, uh, data is everywhere, then, uh, but uh, we lack the insight, right? That's also part of the reason why, that's the main reason why, you know, Antonio on day one uh, focused and talked about that, the fact that we are in the, now in the age of insight, right? Uh, and and uh, and and how to thrive uh, thrive in that age, in this new age. Yeah. Uh, what I uh, then did on the day two keynote, following Antonio, is to talk about the challenges that we need to uh, overcome in order to, in order to thrive in this new age. So maybe we could talk a little bit about some of the things that you you took away in terms. I'm specifically interested in some of the barriers to achieving insights when, you know, customers are drowning in data. What do you hear from customers? What were your takeaway from some of the ones you talked about uh, today? Oh, very pertinent question, Dave. You know, the, the two challenges I spoke about, right? How, uh, that we need to overcome in, in order to thrive in this new age. The first one is, is the current challenge. And that current challenge is, uh, you know, is stated is, you know, barriers to insight, you know, when we are awash with data. So that's a statement, right? How to overcome those barriers? What are the barriers to these uh, to insight when we are awash in data? Um, I in in the data keynote, uh, I spoke about uh, three main things, three main areas that we see from customers. The first one, the first barrier is um, um, in many with many of our customers, uh, data is siloed, right? You know, like in a big corporation, you've got data siloed by sales, finance, engineering, manufacturing, and so on, uh, supply chain, and so on. And um, there's a major effort ongoing in many corporations to build a federation layer above all those silos so that uh, when you build applications above, uh, they can be more intelligent. They can have access to all uh, the different silos of data to get better, intelligent, more intelligent applications built. So that was the, that was the first barrier. We spoke about you know barriers to insight when we are awash with data. The the second barrier is uh, that we see amongst our customers is that uh, uh, data is raw and dispersed when they are stored, and and uh, and you know it, it's tough to get at, too tough to to get uh, value out of them, right? And uh, I in in that case I, I use the example of uh, um, you know the May 6, 2010 event where the stock market dropped a trillion dollars in, in tens of minutes. You know, we, we all uh, know those who are financially attuned would, would uh, know about this uh, uh, incident. But uh, this is not the only incident. There are many of them out there. And for, for that particular May 6th event, uh, you know, it, it took a long time to get insight. Months, yeah, before we, uh, for months we had no insight as to what happened, why it happened, right? Um, and, and there were many other incidences like this. And the regulators were looking for that one rule that could that could mitigate many of these uh, incidences. Um, one of our customers uh, decided to take the hard road to go with the tough data, right? Because data is raw and dispersed. So they went into all the different feeds of financial uh, transaction information, uh, took the took the tough uh, uh, you know took the tough road, and analyzed that data. Took a long time to assemble. And they discovered that there was code stuffing, right? That uh, um, people were sending a lot of trades in and then canceling them almost immediately, yeah, to manipulate the market. Um, and why, why, why didn't we see it immediately? Well, the reason is the process reports 
that everybody sees had, had a uh, rule in there that says all trades less than 100 shares don't need to report in there. And so what people did was to send in a lot of less than 100, tra 100, uh, 100 uh, shares trades uh, to fly under the radar uh, to, to, to do this manipulation. So here is the, here the second barrier, right? Uh, data could be raw and dispersed. Um, sometimes you just have to take the hard road and, um, and to, to, to get insight. And this is one, one great example. And then the last barrier is, uh, is, um, ha has to do with uh, sometimes when you start a project to, to get insight, to, to, get an, uh, uh, to get answers and insight, you, you realize that all the data is around you, but you don't, you don't seem to find the right ones to get what you need. You don't, you don't seem to get the right ones. Yeah? Um, here we have uh, three quick examples of customers. Uh, one, uh, one, one was, a, was a great example, right? Uh, where uh, they were trying to build a, a, a language translator, a machine language translator between two languages, right? But in order to do that, they need to get hundreds of millions of word pairs you know, of one language compared uh, that, with the corresponding other, hundreds of millions of them. They say, where am I going to get all these word pairs? Someone creative thought of a willing source and a huge source. It was the United Nations. You see, so sometimes uh, you, you think you don't have the right data with you, but there might be another source and a willing one uh, that could give you that data. Right? The, the second one uh, has to do with, uh, uh, there was uh, the, um, uh, sometimes you, you may just have to generate that data, interesting one. We had an autonomous car customer that collects all these data from their cars, right? Massive amounts of data, lots of sensors collect lots of data. And, uh, uh, you know, but uh, sometimes they don't have the data they need even after collection. For example, they may have collected the data with the car uh, in, in, um, in fine weather and collected the car driving on this highway in uh, rain and also in snow, but never had the opportunity to collect uh, uh, the car in hail, because that's a rare occurrence. So instead of waiting for a time where the car can drive in hail, uh, they they build a simulation you, by having the car co collected in, in snow and simulated hail. So these are some of the examples where we have customers uh, working to overcome barriers, right? You have barriers that is associated with the fact that data is siloed, they federated it. Uh, barriers associated with uh, data that's tough to get at, they just took the hard road, right? And and sometimes, uh, thirdly, you just have to be creative to get the right data you need. Wow, we can, I, I, I tell you, I have about a hundred questions based on what you just said. So, uh, and as a great example, the flash crash, uh, in fact, Michael Lewis wrote about this in his book, The Flash Boys, and essentially, right, it was high frequency traders trying to front run the market and sending in you know, small block trades, <laughs> trying, to, trying to get, so on the front end, it so that's and they and they chalked it up to a glitch, like you said, for months nobody really knew what it was. So technology got us into this problem. Can, can, I guess my question is, can technology help us get get out of the problem? And that maybe is where AI fits in. Yes, yes. Uh, in, in fact, a uh, lot of analytics work went in uh, to to go back to the raw data that is highly dispersed from different sources, right? Assemble them to see if you can find a a material trend, right? You can see lots of trends, right? Like, uh, you know, we, if, if humans look at things, right? We, we tend to see patterns in clouds, right? So sometimes you need to apply statistical analysis, um, uh, math to, to be sure that uh, what the model is seeing is, is real, right? And, and that required work. Uh, that's one area. The second area is, um, you know, when um, uh, there's an, there are times when uh, you you just need to to go through that uh, uh, that tough uh, approach to to find the answer. Now the the issue uh, that comes to mind now is is that uh, humans put in the rules to decide what goes into a report that everybody sees. And in this case, uh, before the change in the rules, right? But by the way, after the discovery, um, uh, the authorities change the rules and and all. Uh, all shares, uh, all trades of different uh, any size, is, it has to be reported. Right. No. Yeah. Right. But but uh, the rule was applied. Uh, you know, to to say uh, earlier, 
that uh, shares under 100, uh, trades under 100 shares need not be reported. So, so sometimes you just have to understand that uh, reports were decided by humans and, and under, for understandable reasons. I mean, they probably didn't uh, wanted for various reasons not to put all, everything in there so that people could still read it uh, in a reasonable amount of time. But uh, uh, we, we need to understand that rules were being put in by humans for the reports we read. And as such, uh, there are times you just need to go back to the raw data. I want to ask Albeit you- Albeit that it's going to be tough, yeah. Well, yeah, so I, I want to ask you a question about AI. It's obviously, it's in your title and it's something you know a lot about, but, and, and, and I'm going to make a statement. You tell me if it's on point or off point. So it seems that most of the AI going on in the enterprise is, is modeling uh, uh, and data science applied to, you know, troves of data, but, but, but there's, a, there's also a lot of AI going on in consumer, whether it's you know, fingerprint technology or facial recognition or natural language processing. Will, two, two part question, will the consumer market as it has, has so often in the enterprise sort of inform us uh, uh, is for sort of first part. And then will there, there be a shift from sort of modeling, if you will, to more, you mentioned autonomous vehicles, more AI inferencing in real time especially with the edge, if you can help us understand that better. Yeah, this, this, it's a great question, right? Uh, there are three stages uh, to, to, to just simplify. I mean, you know, it's probably more sophisticated than that, but let's keep simplify. There are three stages, right? To, to building an AI system that ultimately can predict, make a prediction, right? Or to, to assist you in decision making, uh, have an outcome. So uh, you start with the data, massive amounts of data that uh, you have to decide what to feed the machine with. So you feed the machine with this um, massive chunk of data and the machine uh, starts to evolve a model based on all the data it's seeing. It starts to evolve, right? To a point that using a test set of data that you have uh, separately kept aside that you know the answer for, then you test the model, uh, you know, after you trained it with all that data to see whether uh, its prediction accuracy is high enough. And once you are satisfied with it, um, you, you then deploy the model uh, to make the decision and that's the inference, right? So a lot of times depend on uh, what, uh, what we are focusing on. Are we, are we um, in data science, are we working hard on assembling the right data to feed the machine with? That's the data preparation organization work. And then after which you build your models, you have to pick the right models for the decisions you and prediction you want it to make. You pick the right models and then you start feeding uh, the data with it. Sometimes you, you pick one model and, and the prediction isn't that uh, robust. It is good, but then it is not consistent, right? Then what you do is uh, um, uh, you try another model. You, so sometimes you just keep trying different models until you get the right kind, yeah? That uh, gives you a good, robust uh, decision-making and prediction. And after which, if it's tested well, uh, Q8, you would then take that model and deploy it at the edge. Yeah. And then at the edge is, is essentially just looking at new data, applying it to the model you have, that you have trained, and then that model will give you a prediction or a decision, right? So uh, it is these three stages, yeah. But uh, more and more, uh, you know, your question reminds me that more and more people are thinking as the edge become more and more powerful, can you also do learning at the edge? Right. That's the reason why we spoke about swarm learning uh, the last time, learning at the edge as a swarm, right? Because maybe individually they may not have enough power uh, to do so, but as a swarm they may. Is that learning from the edge or learning at the edge? In other words, is that- Yes. Yeah, you understand yes. my question, yeah. <laughs> That's a great question. That's a great question, right? So uh, the, the quick answer is uh, learning at the edge, right? Uh, and, and also from the edge, but uh, the, the, the main uh, goal, right? The goal is to learn at the edge so that you don't have to move the data that the edge sees first back to the cloud or the core to do the learning. Because that would be the one of the main reasons why you want to learn at the edge, right? Uh, so, so that you don't need to have to send all that data back and assemble it back from all the different edge devices, assemble it back uh, to the cloud side to, to do the learning, right? With Swarm right. Learning, you can learn it and, and keep the data at the edge and learn at that point, yeah. And then maybe only selectively send out. The, the autonomous yeah. vehicle example you gave is great because maybe they're, you know, they're maybe only persisting, they're not persisting data that is in inclement weather or when a deer runs across the front and then maybe they, they do that, 
And then they send that, that smaller data set back and maybe that's where it's modeling done, but the rest can be done at the edge. It's a, it's a new world that's coming. Down. Let me ask you a question. Is there a limit to what data should be collected and, and, and how it should mm. be collected? That's a great question. Again, you know, uh, Wow, we, uh, today full of these uh, uh, insightful questions. <laughs> that, that actually touches on the, um, the second challenge, right? How, how do we, uh, to, in order to thrive in this uh, new age of insight, um, uh, the second challenge is our, uh, you know, the, the, is our future challenge, right? What, what do we do uh, for our future? And, and in there is um, uh, the, the statement we make is, uh, we have to focus on collecting data strategically for the future of our enterprise. And within that, I, I talk about uh, what to collect, right? Uh, when to organize it when you collect, and then where will your data be, you know, going forward that you are collecting from? So what, when, and, uh, and where? For the what data, for the what data to collect, that, that was uh, your, the question you asked. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's a question that uh, uh, different industries have to ask themselves because it will vary, right? Um, let me give you the, you, you use the autonomous car example. Let me use that. And we, we, we have this customer collecting massive amounts of data. You know, we're talking about uh, 10 petabytes a day from a fleet of their cars. And these are not uh, production autonomous cars, right? These are training autonomous cars, collecting data so they can train and eventually deploy uh, commercial cars, right? Um, so these uh, data collection cars, they collect 10, uh, the fleet of them collect 10 petabytes a day. And when it came to us uh, building a storage system yeah, to, to store all of that data, they real, realized they don't want to afford to store all of it. Now here comes the dilemma, right? Should, what should I, after I spent so much effort building all these cars and sensors and collecting data, I've now decide uh, what to delete. That's a dilemma, right? Now in working with them on this process of tr trimming down what they collected, you know, I'm constantly reminded of uh, the 60s and 70s, right? To remind myself, 60s and 70s, we called a large part of our DNA, junk DNA. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, today we realize that uh, a large part of that, what we call junk has function, has valuable function. They, they are not genes, but they regulate the function of genes, you know? So, so what's junk in the, yesterday could be valuable today yeah? or what's junk today could be valuable tomorrow right so so there's this tension going on right between you deciding not wanting to afford to store everything that you can get your hands on but on the other hand you you, you know you worry you 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 ignore the wrong ones right you can see this tension in our customers right and then it depends on industry here, right? Uh, in healthcare, they say, I have no choice. I, I, I want it all, right? Oh, one very insightful point brought up by one healthcare provider that really touched me was, you know, we are not, we don't only care. Of course, we care a lot. We, we care a lot about the people we are caring for, right? But we also care for the people we are not caring for. How do we find them, mm -hmm. right? And that, therefore, they did not just need to collect data that is uh, that they, they they have with from their patients. They also need to reach out, right, to outside data so that they can figure out who they are not caring for, right. So they want it all. So I tell, ask them, so how, what do you do with funding? If you want it all, they say they have no choice but to figure out a way to fund it. And perhaps monetization of what they have now is the way to come around and fund it. Of course, they also come back to us rightfully that uh, you know, we have to then work out a way to, to, to help them build that system. You know? So that's healthcare, right? And, and if you go to other industry like banking, they say they can afford to, yeah. to keep them all, but they are regulated, same like healthcare, they are regulated as to uh, privacy right? and such like. So many examples, different industries having different needs, but um, I have different approaches to how, how uh, what they collect, but the, there is this constant tension uh, between um, you perhaps deciding not wanting to fund all of that, uh, all that you can store, right? But on the other hand, you know, if you if you kind of don't want to afford it and decide not to store some, uh, maybe those some become highly valuable in the future, right? <laughs> you well, worry. Well, we can make some assumptions about the future, can't we? I mean, we know there's going to be a lot more data than, than we've ever seen before. We, we know that. 
We know, well, notwithstanding supply constraints on things like NAND, we know the price of, the, of storage is going to continue to decline. Uh, we also know, and, and not a lot of people are really talking about this, but the processing power, everybody says Moore's law is dead. Okay, it's waning, but yeah. the processing power when you combine the CPUs and NPUs and GPUs and accelerators and, and so forth actually is, is increasing. And so when you think about these use cases at the edge, you're going to have much more processing power. You're going to have cheaper storage and it's going to be less expensive processing. And so as an AI practitioner, what can you do with that? So the amount of data that's going to come in is going to way exceed, right? Our uh, drop in storage costs, our increase in compute power, right? Right. So what's the answer, right? So, so the, the answer must be knowing that we don't, and, and e even the drop uh, in price and increase in bandwidth, it will overwhelm the increase, 5G, it will overwhelm 5G, right? Given the amount, 55 billion of them collecting, right? So the answer must be, that there might needs to be a balance between you needing to bring all that data from the edge, 55 billion devices of the data back yeah, to a central, as a bunch of central cores, because you, you may not be able to afford to do that. Firstly, bandwidth, even with uh, 5G and, and, and uh, SD-WAN, you'll still be too expensive given the number of devices out there. Well, you know, given storage cost dropping, you'll still be too expensive to try and store them all. So the, the answer must be, to start at least to mitigate the problem, to some leave most or a lot of the data out there, right? And only send back the pertinent ones, as you said before. But then if you did that, then how are we going to do machine learning at the core and the cloud side, if uh, you don't have all the data, you want rich data to train with, right? Uh, some, sometimes you, you want a mix of the, uh, uh, the positive type data and the negative type data, so you can train the machine uh, in a more balanced way. So the answer must be you eventually, right? As we move forward with these huge number of devices out at the edge to do machine learning at the edge. Today, we don't have enough power, right? The edge typically is characterized by a lower uh, 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 energy capability and therefore lower compute power. But soon, you know, uh, even with lower energy, they can do more with compute power, improving in energy efficiency. Right. Uh, so learning at the edge, uh, today we do inference at the edge. So we data, model, deploy, and you do inference at the edge. That's what we do today. But more and more, I believe, given a massive amount of data at the edge, you, you, you have, to, have to start doing machine learning at the edge. And, and if, when you don't have enough power, then you aggregate multiple devices, compute power into a swarm and learn as a swarm. Yeah. Oh, interesting. So now, of course, if, if, if I were sitting in a fly, fly on the wall in an HPE board meeting, I said, okay, HPE is a, is a leading provider of compute. How do you take advantage of that? I mean, we're going, we're, 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 I know it's future, but you must be thinking about that uh, and participating in, in those markets. I know today you are, you have, you know, Edgeline and other products, but there's, it seems to me that it's, it's not the general purpose that we've known in the past. It's a, new type of specialized computing. Uh, how are you thinking about participating in that opportunity for mm. your customers? Mm. The, the world will have to have a balance, right? Uh, where today the default, well, the, the more common mode is to collect the data from the edge and train at, a, and, uh, at some centralized location or a number of centralized location. Um, going forward, given the, the proliferation of the edge devices, we'll, we'll need a balance. We need both. We need capability at the cloud side, right? And it has to be hybrid. And then we need capability on the edge side. Yeah, that, uh, that we need to build systems that, that on one hand uh, is uh, ed edge adapted, right? Meaning the uh, environmentally adapted because the edge different, they are on it. A lot of times are on the outside. Uh, they need to be uh, packaging uh, adapted and also power adapted, right? Because typically uh, many of these devices are battery powered. Right, um, so we have to build systems that adapts to it, but at the same time, they must not be uh, custom. That's my belief. They must be uh, using standard processes and standard operating system so that they can run uh, a rich uh, set of applications. So yes, um, that's that's also the insightful for that, that Antonio um, announced uh, in in twenty eighteen. Uh, 
for the next four years from 2018, right, uh, four billion dollars invested uh, to strengthen our edge portfolio, mm-hmm. our edge product lines, yeah. right, mm-hmm. edge solutions. I could, I, Dr. Go, I could go on for hours with you. You're, you're just such a great guest. I, 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 let's close. I, I, what are you most excited about in, in the future of, 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 of certainly HPE, but the industry in general? Yeah, I, I think the excitement is uh, the customers, right? The diversity of customers and, and their diversity in, in, in the way they have approached their different problems to data strategy. So the excitement is around data strategy, right? Just like, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the statement made was, was so, uh, was profound, right? Um, and Antonio said, we are in the age of insight powered by data. That's the first line, right? Uh, the, the, the line that comes after that is, as such, we are, we, we are becoming more and more data centric with data, the currency. Now the next step is even more uh, profound, that is, um, you know, we are going as far as saying that, you know, um, data should not be treated as cost anymore. No, right? But instead, as an investment in a new asset class called data with value on our balance sheet. This is a, this is a, a, a step change, right? Right, uh, in, in thinking that uh, is, is going to change the way we look at data the way we value it. So that's a statement. So this is the, the exciting thing because, because for, for me, a CTO of AI, right? Uh, uh, a, a machine is only as intelligent as the data you feed it with. Data is a source of the machine learning to be intelligent. Right? So, so that's, that's why when, when the people start to value data, right? And, and, and say that it is an investment when we collect it, it is very positive for AI because an AI system gets intelligent, get more intelligence because it has a, a huge amounts of data and a diversity of data. Yeah. Yeah. So it'd be great if the community valued, values data. Well, you certainly see it in the valuations of many companies these days. Um, and I think increasingly you see it on the income statement, you know, data products and people monetizing data services and yeah, maybe eventually you'll see it in the, in the balance sheet. I know Doug Laney, when he was at Gartner Group, uh, wrote a book about this and a lot of people are thinking about it. It's, that's a big change, isn't it? Dr. Yeah, Gump. yeah. <laughs> the question is, is the, the process and methods in valuation, right? But uh, yeah, right. We'll, I believe we'll get there. We need to get started. Then we'll, we'll, we'll get there, I believe. Yeah. Dr. Go, it's always and, a and pleasure. Then, and, then the AI, and then the AI will, 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 will benefit greatly from it. Oh yeah, no doubt. Uh, people will better understand how to align you know, some of these technology investments. Dr. Go, great to see you again. Thanks so much for coming back on theCUBE. It's a, been a real pleasure. Yes, uh, a system uh, is only as smart as the data you feed it with. Uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, excellent, we'll leave it there. Thank you for spending some time with us and keep it right there for more great interviews from HPE Discover 21. This is Dave Vellante for theCUBE, the leader in enterprise tech coverage. We'll be right back. Thank you.